Why would special collections slash archives want family heirlooms like old photos and letters? Well, first, I think um, I want to touch on that. Um, you know, a lot of times people think if people even know what an archives <laughs> is, um, then they usually do think about um, at a university that our library would have the university's records and be the university's archives, um, which is true and is, of course, a very crucial part of what we do. Um, but we do also collect um, and preserve things related to um, just, you know, the culture and the history of our area. Um, and so that does come from the personal papers of people, of families, um, local organizations. And, um, you know, family heirlooms are some of the most uh, unique things that there are. Um, and so people's letters, diaries, scrapbooks, photos, um, even if maybe they don't feel like they were necessarily, um, you know, they weren't famous or they weren't super influential. Um, but their material can really give insight into a specific time, a specific place, a culture. Um, and so, you know, those are definitely things that we love to have. I think it also just kind of speaks to, I don't, you know, a part of human nature, like we all, um, maybe not all, but a lot of people <laughs> uh, tend to, um, you know, react more to seeing, uh, you know, a family scrapbook versus, um, you know, reading old newspapers or something. Um, people like to kind of see that personal side of history. Um, and so that's definitely something that, you know, we like. Um, and especially if it's, you know, a family that has collected material over the course of time. So over many generations, that's also really cool to have and can be a great research tool for people to sort of see how things have changed or stayed the same. Um, so I think I like to think of personal photos, um, personal heirlooms as sort of like little microcosms of history um, that then people can use either on their own or to supplement, you know, other research that they're doing with maybe some bigger, um, more kind of like mass produced things. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. Um, uh, Alicia, Chris, would you have anything to add to that? Well, I could just add to that um, kind of from the current perspective of what we're looking at. I've gotten a lot of questions on what was campus like back in 1918 during the Spanish flu. And so we have the local student newspaper and you know, we have some letters from students that were going home or, um, you know, not on campus or, or joining the war effort at the time. And so it really does sort of tell the tale of what was happening both on campus and in Knoxville uh, during the Spanish flu. So, and that story can help us sort of understand maybe what we're experiencing today and how students are experiencing it. Obviously they weren't taking Zoom classes back then. Um, it was a little bit different experience since there was the war effort going on. And a lot of the male students had um, were not on campus at that point. So we had uh, a larger female population and homecoming was um, canceled the year before. And so it was a lot of the sporting events um, as well. So we've seen things like this before and it, but the student experience um, and them talking about how they were, you know, sad that their favorite things were canceled and maybe they didn't have the same experience that they had in years prior, but that, um, you know, that they were helping out with the war effort, making bandages and masks actually in the live in a room in the library at the time. So, I mean, it's, it's a really kind of unique experience to look at that and look at the efforts that everyone has put in currently and how that they're very similar. Um, and the students' experiences are very similar, even though we have all this technology now. Yeah, that's a great specific example for sure.